My name is Aaron Wood. I work for Verizon Labs. Uh, Tim Hansen, senior software engineer also at Verizon Labs. Uh, this is a presentation about uh, our fault tolerant framework. Um, we wrote our own uh, scheduler uh, based right on top of the open source um, protobufs uh, for Mesos. And we're going to talk a bit about um, our scheduler and framework as well as how we uh, integrated CNI uh, without Docker. Uh, so in the very beginning, we had kind of an easy choice to make, I would say. So um, a lot of the frameworks I've seen so far are still using the older V0 API that require bindings and has a, a bit of a different architecture underneath for how the framework communicates with Mesos and how Mesos communicates back. Um, so uh, I mean, as you can kind of see, it was pretty easy to pick the V1 API because it's just a very easy um, stream that we can subscribe to. Uh, we can compress it. We don't need any bindings, so we could pick any language we want. Uh, I mean, I guess technically you could do the same with the V0 API. You just have to write your own bindings. But uh, for this, this was really easy for us because we could just kind of pick it up and go. Um, we, we, picked, uh, we decided to stick with the protobuf payloads in, instead of supporting both protobuf and JSON. Uh, for us internally, we didn't really have a use case to support both, so we just did V1 with the compressed protobuf payloads to be the most efficient. Uh, so we use Go as our language of choice for our framework and our SDK. Uh, so Verizon Labs is really big on Go. Um, a lot of the, the new developments going on there are, are using Go. Um, we kind of have uh, uh, vested interest in it. A lot of things are a lot of things started in it, and a lot of people that were brought in kind of uh, learned it from the ground up at Verizon Labs. Not everyone, but a lot of people, it was like their, it was a new language for them. Uh, so what Go gives us specifically is uh, increased developer speeds. It's a higher level language, but it's still really fast and doesn't take up much memory. Um, and since like schedulers and any kind of scheduler in Mesos is mostly just I.O. since you're communicating with Mesos and kind of coordinating tasks and resources and scheduling, it's, it, we don't really need like anything lower that, you know, we're not like crunching any numbers, so this was perfect for us. Uh, the concurrency primitives in Go are great, so uh, it makes it really easy to do um, threading and concurrency and uh, all that good stuff. And we get uh, single binaries in the end for our, both our scheduler and executor. Um, so it makes it really easy to deploy. And if for some reason we ever wanted to deploy these in a container, we could just take like a Scratch or BusyBox or Alpine image, which is like two or five megabytes, just drop it in and, and deploy it that way. Uh, you want to talk about the SDK? So as we started our development on the scheduler, we noticed a lot of common um, functionality. So we said, hey, we should just make an SDK for Go. Um, there is another Go SDK out there that was written by one fellow from uh, Mesosphere. I'm blanking on his name right now, but um, a lot of what they had done was um, customize their protobuf. So it was hard to take the, uh, the protobuf definitions that we had um, from Mesos and then compile them. And then what we ended up getting was some custom um, um, protobufs that they had utilized. So it wasn't easy to transfer over and uh, define the protobufs from the open source version uh, compared to the one that we had found online that was already out there. So we ended up just using our own SDK because anytime there's a, a version update and the protobufs get updated, we want to just run proto C, create the, the Go bindings, and then just go. Right? We'll be done with it. Uh, it's a lot easier. Um, some of the common patterns we had um, is, you know, the uh, scheduler framework, what that will look like, um, task lifecycle management, uh, lifecycle management of offers, resources that are coming in from the cluster. Um, also de decoding the uh, record I.O. event decoder. Um, so if anybody's familiar with writing frameworks, uh, when you uh, uh, authorize and connect to the master and um, you connect, it gives you back a, um, a data structure essentially in the form of a stream called record I.O. tells you how many bytes you have and then gives you a payload message. So all of that decoding is done in the SDK. Um, as well as we have a, an abstraction for our persistence storage backends. Uh, we use etcd, but we didn't want to make um, any decisions for anybody else. So if people want to use Z Zookeeper or anything, um, 
they, they can choose their own back end for that. Um, and we have our own protobus as well that we've defined for the scheduler and executor. So, so containers are definitely just containers. There's nothing really too special about them. Um, part of this talk was, you know, we, we started using Docker um, and we used Marathon. It, it worked fine for most of our use cases. And uh, we ran into a lot of issues once we started optimizing things and wanting additional features that Docker didn't give us, like an additional uh, network interface, which where CNI comes in. Um, so we, we had a real big push to go towards the UCR and also get away from vendor lock-in. We didn't want to be stuck with Docker. We wanted to be able to do run C or any other type of uh, uh, container runtime. So some of the reasons why we went towards the UCR, again, like I said, we didn't need Docker and all the dependencies to be installed. Um, we noticed a lot that um, operationally, when we had customers using our cluster, that Docker daemon would get stuck or crash, or system D would cause some issue, and that would go up to da the Docker daemon and get stuck. And it was causing a lot of pain points for our customers. Um, with the UCR, we haven't had as many issues in terms of bugs um, during production. Uh, there's a reduced attack surface we can control uh, the types of um, issues that are happening with uh, um, the UCR. You can be very specific about exactly what you want it to run. Um, and there's also no need to manage secrets. Um, this, a, a little while ago, I can't remember what release it was for Mesos, you had to actually use kind of a hack and use the fetcher to grab um, the Docker JSON with the encoded um, registry information loaded into your container and then use that to authenticate to a registry and then pull down your image. Now you can actually just send it right into the protobuf. Um, and now we also have OCI support. Um, Docker has that as well, uh, but we have broader support for container image specifications with uh, the UCR compared to Docker. Um, so the UCR isn't without its faults. Uh, so we hit a lot of issues on um, any version of Mesos less than 1.2. Uh, so if anyone's looking to use the UCR, I would recommend sticking with 1.2 and up. Um, so I, I just put up some of the JIRAs here. Uh, if anyone's interested in looking them up, you know, feel free. But um, generally, the, the bottom section is, it describes a bunch of issues around um, the overlay handling and um, the whiteout files and uh, the whiteout's not being applied properly, and uh, some of the image backend problems we hit were, uh, I think like one of them was the older versions of Mesos defaulted to use the copy backend, so when you um, pull down a Docker image, it will use this copy backend, and it, it failed on something when it was untarring, and there were sim links, so it just exploded. Um, there are a couple of other issues surrounding that. Um, I think there are even some issues with the, their other backends and the older versions. Um, so we, so there's a little bit more than this, but generally like the issues here kind of affect 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 .1, and a lot of the minor versions in between. So we just totally skipped those versions. Um, thankfully we had the, the luxury to do that. And we would really like to see user namespace support in the UCR. I know this is something that they're, they're thinking about working on. Uh, there are some some um, issues right now that make it really difficult for them to implement this. Like, I think they're hoping to wait for um, dust to settle on UID shifts when you mount. So, like, so when you have two containers and they share a volume, and they're both they're both pointing at this volume, it doesn't turn into a total disaster with different UIDs and everything. Um, I think SecComp they're moving pretty quickly towards. It's a much easier thing to implement. Uh, so. Initially, we were thinking of doing this stuff in our custom executor that's part of the framework, but I think it makes more sense to have it in Mesos in the long run because then everyone can benefit from it and you don't have to have your own custom executor if you don't want, you can just use the default executor. So definitely not a smooth path, but once we like, got through all these issues, it's been, it's been good, it's been really good. So I had recorded a demo initially. Um, I wanna do a live demo instead, take the risk, so why not? Um, so I just want to show uh, launching maybe 500 tasks uh, on our framework uh, in our cluster and just kind of give you an idea of like how easy it is to use. 
and just like show you what it would be like to, to do this with, with a custom framework. switch this over to the other screen? Do you know how I can switch this over to the other screen? We can write a framework, but we can't operate a Mac. It's not our specialty. Not so. a Mac guy. Yeah, totally yeah. Guy. yeah. Sorry, guys. Here we go. Yeah. I'll just, uh, Mirror displays. Yeah, yep. That's good. Uh, yeah, enlarge. You guys see that okay? Is that all right? I, can, I guess I can zoom in a little bit too. Is that all right? Yeah. So, so this is uh, the Mesos. Sorry. So, so this is the Mesos UI um, for for uh, the cluster that's running in our our uh, our cloud that we actually are are working on in addition to our framework. So we we're building out our own cloud and the framework's running on top of it. And um, I just want to show you like how all the tasks will be running and how smooth of a process it is. We've basically tunneled into our cluster. Um, we're just going to run uh, basically a load tester that we have, 500 tests. Um, go for it. So what this is doing is hitting our endpoint. Um, our API is just returning this simple little uh, JSON payload back, telling you that it was successfully queued. Um, it will just keep going until it's done. And you'll actually see it appear in the uh, web UI for the master. So we can see all the tasks here running. Um, it's it's very simple. Um, it's extremely fast. We've done some other tests. Um, I launched 50,000 tasks because it was awesome. There's really no reason to do it, but um, it was able to launch 50,000 tasks in roughly, I think it was like 40 something seconds. So it's quite quick. Um, I believe uh, a demo we had done two years ago, uh, I think it was two years ago that Larry did a demo on Marathon and Marathon did it in about 70 seconds. So we're actually faster than Marathon in terms of our task deployment. So uh, the tasks that I'm launching are kind of basic. They're just like a very general, like, you know, they might echo something and sleep for some random period uh, with a range and then just finish. Um, so one of the things that's a little bit unique about our framework is we made it flexible to not only run uh, long running tasks, but also like jobs. So when things, I mean, when things fail and they, or crash or fail hard, we'll actually get like failure statuses. But if you have something that runs and completes and exits zero, it will be finished. You know, it's not, it's some of the other frameworks when they see something stop or go down, regardless of how they exit, they'll try to reschedule it. So we'll just, we disregard it as finished. So if you have a long running process, just we're, we'll, we assume that if you crash or um, if you stop running, then something's gone wrong and you've crashed. Uh, otherwise, if you exit successfully, we assume that's OK. And uh, this is kind of interesting, so kind of like a side note. But the, I found the newer versions of Mesos, to, uh, for the web UI anyway, if you view it over a tunnel, um, it's always trying to like hit the internal IPs of the uh, new leader that it's trying to detect or any agents that you go to. So. You might just see some of the, these errors pop up, so I, I have to keep refreshing manually to get around that. Um, so I think most of these should be done. Yeah, so everything is completed, everything's finished. You can see um, it's really pretty simple. You know, once you have the, the basics of a framework up and running, um, to however you want to accept data to launch tasks and actually run it, it's 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 really quick. Um, Go has helped us to be really efficient, so this takes like practically no CPU. Even like heavily loading it, it's not that much. There's not that much memory. It's maybe like what do we measure? Like 15 megabytes of memory when he when he was hitting it with 50,000 tasks at the most. It's like nothing, absolutely nothing. So. Um, we also open sourced our framework. Um, so if you'd like to check it out, Verizon, uh, it's at github.com slash Verizon Labs slash hydrogen. Um, we'd love to take pull requests, any reviews. You can tell us our code sucks. Um, 
anything would be awesome. We'd really appreciate it. Um, and if you run it too, just for fun, you know, at home on some Raspberry Pis or whatever, that'd be cool too. Uh, we want to support all use cases. Uh, we really tried to make uh, make the SDK because we wanted more people to utilize it and not just make it specific for uh, Verizon. Um, so it'd be great to see what other people use it for. And um, our focus was really smaller clusters and workloads. Uh, Marathon's very good at using or um, uh, for Marathon's better for larger clusters, so like a thousand plus nodes. But some companies, or I should say most companies, probably run maybe anywhere from the uh, 50 to 100 or a few hundred node uh, range, right, for their workloads. So um, another aspect that we want to talk about is container networking interface. Like I mentioned earlier, the uh, main issue that we had with Docker was we couldn't use multiple networking interfaces. Uh, this was a big problem for us on our front end. We wanted a public IP in our container and we wanted a back end IP. We also wanted to be able to plug in, say, a storage network, um, whatever. We wanted to give it multiple interfaces. We couldn't do that. We also wanted to change the way that we were networking. Um, Docker just gave us pretty much just the bridge and the, the NAT, right? You get your 172.117.0.1 slash 16, it hands it out and NATs it. And that was problematic for some of our applications that are very networking heavy and or doing long-lived TCP connections. Um, so you can see a supported type of plugins here for container network interface. I don't know if uh, how many people here have heard of CNI, know what it is. Just raise a hand. Okay, you guys already know then. I won't go over it. Um, so you're well aware of you know, how CNI works and um, all the things that it supports. The good thing is, since it's a standard and the uh, UCR supports it, we can then leverage that, make our own plugin if we wanted to, and we can also hook in as many interfaces that we want um, into each container. So uh, what we've done is, um, just go back one second, sorry. What we've done is, we've stuck with Bridge for now, um, but we use a host local IPAM. So we run on a 10 uh, slash 8 network uh, for IPv4. And um, what we end up doing is giving each host the dot one. It acts as a router. We route on the host. And each slash 24 gives us 254 usable addresses for containers per host. We actually don't need um, a DHCP server because each host um, has a specified um, format, right? So it's 10.rack.slot on our chassis in the physical data center. And what that allows us to do is um, we don't need to really keep track of things. The host just needs to know about that slash 24, and it's all unique across every host, and we're all good. So we actually reduced the need for DHCP right there, which was pretty cool, uh, because even managing DHCP got a little bit annoying um, when things would go down, then other tasks would go down, and it sort of escalates from there. Uh, we do uh, in our lab, use Mac VLAN. We've also done um, uh, IP VLAN. Test a lot of different things. We've written our own plugins as well. We're trying to accomplish uh, eVPN, which would be really cool to do uh, for VXLAN for multi-tenancy inside of our clusters. Uh, so there's other things that we're looking into, and uh, CNI is definitely really exciting to uh, enable us to be able to do all these different networking types in the in the data center. So since you guys already know about CNI, how it works, I won't go over this. This is just a bland, you know, where does everything go? How does it actually you know, interface with Mesos? Um, so all, all you need to do now in our uh, definition, you can see this on GitHub in the readme about how to uh, launch a task on our framework. You really just need to define a, a network, um, just like CNI. Tell it, OK, it's a bridge, it's Mac VLAN, whatever it might be. Give it the name DataNet, um, my network, whatever it might want to be. Um, and then the network protobuf for us underneath the covers, we just say this name. You don't even have to say CNI. You just say my network inside of your task. And you can put multiple of them. It's a list that it takes in. And when you do that, you can end up getting any number or any end number of uh, network interfaces. And they can be each unique type, right? So one could be a bridge, one could be Mac VLAN, one could be VXLAN. I mean, you can do whatever you want with it, which is pretty awesome. Um, we've done that in our cluster uh, for segregating our storage. And we also have um, one for our front end, so we can define our front end network with public IPs and pick right from that pool. So we no longer have to manage state of who has what IP or here or there. Uh, some people can also pick static IPs that are reserved, and it'll always give them that static IP. So we can use any cast on the front end. So we can have six or seven, eight 
whatever 100 instances of some application uses any cast, and whatever is closest, it just gets routed via uh, eBGP and gets hit. Uh, any questions about uh, CNI? I just want to make sure everybody knows what it is and I'm not skimming over anything. So, Okay, cool. I just wanted to uh, touch on one other thing, too, before we moved on. Um, we didn't put too much about this in our, our talk because it's a little bit m more specific. Um, but I want to say that we did make our framework HA. So uh, if anyone's thinking about making a framework, I would say that, in general, it's very easy to do. Uh, if you're using like a, um, a distributed key value store underneath, or if you're using Zookeeper, it's even easier because they have more primitives. But with that CD, um, all we really needed to do was, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but generally, like, we have all of these frameworks come up. Uh, one wins as the leader. Uh, then the, the ones that don't win connect to the, the leader. And then when, if that framework ever comes down, uh, the, another one, they'll all basically fight for the leader position again, and one of them will win, and we'll go back to this connection model. So the reason why we had this, like, TCP connection across all of our frameworks is because uh, Zookeeper, internally has this um, ephemeral Z node concept, and I believe underneath it's just a TCP connection, so like when you die, your connection gets cut, your, uh, your key goes away. So we've kind of emulated that, so after, after getting that part solved, it was very easy. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that very quickly. Yep. And what, one quick note about that as well is we have etcd as our backing store, and that already runs the raft consensus algorithm. Um, so there was really no need for us to implement another consensus algorithm. It's sort of a waste of time. So basically what he's describing is um, we just have each leader, leader try to do um, a TTL key, basically, in, in etcd. Whatever gets there first becomes the leader, and etcd takes care of distributing that state. Um, so once that key goes away and it hasn't been refreshed for some n amount of configurable time, we can pick a new leader, and we assume that's a network partition. Uh, but back to uh, CNI, uh, I mentioned a lot of this as well. Um, one of the biggest things for us was end user visibility in a multi-tenant environment. Uh, when somebody looks at their application, um, you don't want them to be able to see other people's networks. You, know, you don't want them to be able to connect to it, ruin it, um, send crazy amounts of broadcasts over it, do whatever they might do. Um, so the isolation is really key for us, and it allowed us to um, Basically, you know, like a VM where you, it looks like you have your own private bridge network or an L2 network, you can do the same thing with containers um, and have multiple tenants on it. And you can actually manage each network from CNI um, per service or customer, however you want to put that. Um, and the, all the other benefits that come with standardization, right? There's no vendor lock-in. We can move to uh, different standards above that. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, we can change to a, an overlay mechanism like VXLAN or NVGRE without the end user noticing. So um, say if we originally used a bridge for this customer, we can say, hey, we're going to do uh, VXLAN. They don't even have to know what that is. We can just do it, and it will work underneath. Um, it also gives you uh, decent IPAM uh, address management. Like I said, CNI doesn't have DHCP on its own. What it will do is uh, basically make a call to any other DHCP management system. Um, so you can run like... Uh, ISC DHCP server, and that'll take care of it for you. And DNI basically calls some hooks into there for that. So sorry for the tiny text here, but uh, this is some logs from our agents. Um, you can see there's uh, two networks, DevNet and DataNet. This container got 1150.11.2, uh, and the other one got 1050.11.12 slash 24. These are just two networks I made, um, just, just as a face of example. Um, but there's some logs here just to show that there's some um, IPs coming there. And this is the host local with a bridge. So these are just two bridge networks on the host that got attached into the UCR. And you can see this is, uh, yeah, I just used NS Enter, got into the namespace, uh, did an IP address show, and you can see the two uh, Vs there. They're both lower up. You know, you can talk over everything. The routes are there if you want to get out. Um, one thing that we did run into is that whatever uh, network comes up, this default route sometimes goes out the wrong interface. So sometimes we need to make sure that the default route is correct for that uh, application. Namely, if you have a front-end network <laughs> and someone's trying to get out to the internet but the default route is out the uh, the internal network, it's not going to work. So um, there's some ordering that has to go there. But this is just an example. But I wanted to explain that caveat. 
Um, is anybody else uh, enabled any um, multiple network interfaces in the UCR? I haven't heard of this in the community. I'm really curious if somebody else has gotten this to work or done anything with it. No? Okay. I'm really excited about it. So. All right. Uh, there's no IPv6 support in Mesos right now. Um, it's being actively worked on, and um, C and I just got uh, some preliminary features for that. But I'd be really interested um, in getting that done uh, with IPv6. IP per container becomes extremely easy. Uh, you don't have to worry about stepping on toes. Um, we don't have support for dynamic traffic policy filtering. Um, this can be done in other ways, but it'd be really nice to have a hook inside of CNI. It could just be another plugin, uh, but that's not really there yet. Um, and support for dynamic updates to existing network configurations. Um, I believe it was before Mesos 1.2. Uh, the CNI configs, um, you actually had to restart the agent to read the configs into memory. But now you can change the network configs and it reads it on demand. So if you change the existing network config now, um, it should just update and you don't have to restart the agent and you know, restart all these containers and cause a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, so, so before we wrap up for questions, I just want to uh, say that we get asked a lot why we made our own framework. You know, it's, it's generic. It's sort of, a, I mean, Marathon obviously has more features. It's been out a lot longer. Um, but we, it's, it's kind of a generic framework that anyone can use. Um, but I think the real power from this comes from uh, some future work that we're going to do. But also a lot of the, the CNI and storage stuff that we have um, going on in the background, too. So. One of the things that we had talked about doing um, in the near future is kind of tying the framework into some, some more advanced scheduling algorithms. So we want to basically um, efficiently schedule tasks uh, into nodes across uh, fault domains and shut down everything that we're not using. So when we do need to scale up, we can actually like, integrate our framework with uh, IPMI tool or make a call out to IPMI ourselves or however we want to do it and power things on dynamically as we need them. Um, we can also do a lot of fancy stuff in our custom executor. So we were actually, like I said earlier, we were thinking of doing user namespaces and set comp in there. Um, might be better to have it in Mesos and focus on doing it in Mesos instead. But, uh, you know, we had some security requirements where we wanted to make use of keys in the TPM. We can integrate with that. We can uh, we can do a lot of stuff that is very unique to our platform. And since we're building the platform and the framework, we can we can be very efficient and and uh, and kind of control everything from start to end. So while it might be generic, um, it gives us a lot of flexibility, really a lot of flexibility, and we can move very fast and we can fix things very fast. And um, I have to add that, you know, it was mentioned earlier today, just getting away from Zookeeper has been, like, excellent. Um, etcd is, has been really good for us so far. And uh, one of the things we're doing uh, with Mesos is we're evaluating um, ZetCD, which I believe is from CoreOS. So it's basically like a, 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 a layer that sits in the middle. So you point Mesos at it, and it accepts, uh, like, an incoming uh, uh, Zookeeper interface, so it connects like it thinks it's Zookeeper, but it goes back to etcd. So uh, the the 500 tasks that I launched earlier onto our cluster and showed you how they're all running, that is that's actually an etcd backend, and we have we have five masters, and I think we have five instances of our framework and and three or five instances of etcd. Um, so it's um, I think things are changing and getting easier, and people are going to have more options, and it, it just gives a lot of flexibility. We're just going to open up to questions. Um, any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned the framework that you guys wrote uh, is intended for smaller clusters. What's limiting? What is limiting it from scaling to clusters of larger sizes? Nothing right now. Um, we can test on larger clusters. Uh, but we haven't done that. The use case internally was for smaller clusters, um, but you can certainly try and use it on larger clusters. Um, one of the performance issues we had was scaling past a thousand nodes, um, even with Marathon. And what ends up happening is I think Zookeeper itself struggles to keep up with all the state, especially if you have a lot of tasks. And the policy management there for, or I should say, lifecycle management of tasks 
um, becomes very difficult because with Marathon, a task will try f forever. And you know, application owners will say, I want it to start as fast as possible. So if you have a task that's just dying, it'll just flap forever and it never dies. Um, we're a little bit opinionated about that in our framework where we will kill the task after so many retries and say, hey, like, your stuff is broken. You should probably go fix it, right? Um, so some of those little tweaks like that about policy management, um, I guess, end user uh, education on how better to use the cluster and uh, not just throw a bunch of bo broken tasks on there <laughs> help scale a little bit, um, as well as uh, um, health checks, uh, I know now the uh, health checks are out of experimental, right? The, the ones that go from, yeah, so uh, Mesos finally um, has health checks that go back to the executor instead of the scheduler. Um, that helps scale as well. Um, and some other issues as well. I know the design of Mesos DNS, um, we're starting to design our own DNS um, because Mesos DNS right now actually hits the master and just gets a huge list of state from the master and does it very frequently. Um, so we're basically trying to leave the master with just its core responsibilities uh, in our framework, and we're hoping that will allow us to scale a lot more if we distribute the workload of uh, cluster management across um, the executor and our own, um, our own framework. So to answer your question, wrap full, full circle, I don't think there's anything uh, necessarily limiting it. We just haven't tested on anything really larger than I think like 100 nodes or somewhere around there. But um, we're actually going to take over a lab, and um, I think it's about 600 nodes. So we'll see how it runs there. Uh, but if you want to run it on 1,000 nodes, that'd be awesome. Talk to me. <laughs> I'd, lo I'd love to know how that goes. Yeah. Just to quickly add, um, we, one of the things we focused on around that was, was the, how we're storing state in etcd and how we're retrieving it and how much we store. Because we have hit a lot of issues with um, I mean, it, I don't know if it's so much Zookeeper or Marathon, it's just how much state Marathon stores and the limits of Zookeeper and the Z nodes and the older versions of Marathon stored, you know, different amounts and maybe the newer versions. And that's, um, we took a lot of time and iterated a lot on that. Sure, there's a question, oh, two questions. Yeah. Uh, what was the reason, so you, you created your own SDK, or are you using DCOS SDK? No, this is our own SDK. We Any, didn't want to use... Any particular reason? I'm sorry? Any particular use, uh, reason for doing that compared to using SDK from DCOS? Yes. Um, so we didn't want to use... Feel free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we didn't feel like using their uh, SDK because there was... Uh, it, it limits us, um, right? We wanted a lot of customization. We're really after performance in our clusters. Um, while having a YAML format is cool to make your, your framework, that's really good, I think, for um, basic tasks or, and or very uh, cookie cutter type of things. But if you want to get really extensible, uh, really squeeze performance out of your cluster and uh, get rid of a JVM, <laughs> which makes my boss happy, um, uh, then that's why we do it, right? Um, it has its place, don't get me wrong. If you want to do that, um, absolutely, you can use it. But um, we just, it wasn't for our use case. Yeah, we kind of have like two, almost two levels in SDK. At the very basic level, we have like the protobuf bindings, um, which I think Mesos just now brought into their official like Apache repos. But um, we have an opinion, more opinionated later on top, which kind of provides like, you know, a default task manager and a default uh, resource manager and things that every scheduler, scheduler will have to handle on their own no matter what. So we've tried to like just make that a right once type thing. Um, we're also Go, so a lot of the existing stuff in, uh, from Mesosphere and, and in DCOS is, is Java. Just, it's fine, it's just we went with Go. Any other questions? More questions? All right, thanks guys. All right, thank you.